Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Behind the Desk, a podcast all about my time working in a recording studio. I'm John, and today, today is a Saturday. And I like Saturdays, they're usually pretty chilled. And with the latest social distancing rules in the UK, I don't have to run up any karaoke sessions that we call pop music experience at work, which means my Saturdays are free. And I love it. But we're not here to talk about karaoke today. No, I thought I would answer a question that I had during the first week of me working at Loft Music Studios. And the question is, pause for dramatic effect, what does a normal recording setup look like? And this is not really a straightforward answer because there is a lot to consider, which I'll explain throughout today's episode. So, before we get started, if you have any questions about me, my time in the studio, music technology, or the podcast itself, then you can message me at Wellesley Media on Facebook or Instagram, and I'll try to answer as best as I can. Now, let's get started. What does a normal recording setup look like? Well, it depends on what you mean by normal. Because in a recording studio, you could be recording a number of different things, The most common thing we get in the studio is vocals because of COVID and the fact that we only have one person in the studio at a time. We have had two people come in on some occasions and they've been guitarists or drummers or an engineer and an instrument player, you know, but no bands yet for obvious reasons. But they could also have a number of instruments that we could record differently. So I guess it depends on what you're recording. And I was thinking about this, and looking back, this was not an easy question to answer, or an easy question to give someone. So, there's probably a reason I didn't get a straightforward answer when I asked people. But if somebody was to ask me now, then I'd probably explain how we set up a vocal recording, because that's what the most common thing is we have to record. And for the most part, the majority of vocal recordings work more or less the same way. Now I always think of vocal recordings as two separate things, you've either got rap vocals and other vocals. Now a lot of rappers come into the studio, uh, it was all I recorded for like the first week working in the studio, and they usually have a similar sound, which is like they want a lot of low end, they want it to sound aggressive, they want it to sound punchy, and a lot of the time they'll start bouncing around a little bit when they're in the recording booth. Uh, it might be because they're just getting into the song, which is great, but not when you want to get a good consistent sound from them. Because you see, the microphone we use to record rappers is an SM7B dynamic microphone. And the reason we use this is because the other type of microphone we have usually picks up too much high end and a lot of mouth noise if the performer has a dry mouth or bad vocal technique. The SM7B also has a roll off in the high end of the frequency spectrum, which means it doesn't pick as much it doesn't pick up as much high end frequency sounds. This makes recordings with this microphone warmer, I guess, without getting rid of too much at the top for it to sound unnatural. I mean, I have tried recording rappers with the SM7B and the Brawner Phantom, which is the other microphone we have, and it just sounds better in the SM7B in my opinion. That is what the student before me said to use, and that's what I use, and that's what the other intern uses as well. So it's pretty much the go-to microphone when recording rappers at Loft. By all means, if your studio has a different setup with microphones or different microphones altogether, then by all means, use whatever they have but that's just what we use at Loft. And then when we're not recording rappers, we tend to use the broader Phantom to record any other vocals, especially female vocals or people with a vocal range higher than bass or baritone, which is most people, I should say. And the reason for this is because, again, a few reasons. One, it's an expensive microphone, but it's worth the price because the microphone picks up every sound with a lot of detail. You don't have to have your mouth millimetres away from the mic itself. Although you shouldn't do that with most microphones because of the proximity effect. And the most optimal distance between your mouth and the microphone is usually about 6 inches. 
but even at 10 inches away, the brawner usually picks up a lot of detail from the performer. And this also includes mouth noise, which are boosted by this microphone because it has a high boost, which, which well, I say high, it has a boost in high frequency ranges, which means that higher frequencies and pitches are made louder by this microphone naturally. But any other frequency, like mid-tones, low frequencies, are not boosted or cut at all. In fact, the Brawner has a very flat response overall in all the other frequency bands. So that means the microphone doesn't change much of the sound it actually picks up. And when paired with a singer who has a nice voice to begin with, it just picks up the sound as it is, which is why we use it for other vocalists. It doesn't work for everyone, but that's the go-to microphone if we're not using the SM7B. Now, when we record vocals, we're recording in our recording booth, which is basically a soundproofed conservatory, but indoors. That's the best way I can describe it. And because I've done a lot of vocal recordings in this booth, I can sort of tell the acoustics of this room are pretty dry. Like, maybe a little bit of reverb coming, reverb coming off the glass, which is good, but we also want to add all the reverb later in the process. So the fact that it sounds dry is pretty good. But once we have the microphone set up, then we patch it all into the patch bay into the wall, which is wired up into the patch bay in the control room, where I am. And then there is some tech we go through called preamps. Preamps do what they say, they amplify the sound coming in from the microphone. And in the studio, we normally go through a Neve preamp. We have other ones as well, like UADs and DAVs, or DAVs and roosters. But I'm honestly not going to pretend I know the difference between them all. I know there is a difference, but they all practically do the same job. All I know is the circuitry on the insides gives the sound slightly different characteristics when you run a signal through them all. Like some of the preamps give you a more low mid distortion, giving it a warmer sound and others sound very clean, which means there's very little distortion and it sounds sharper, crisper, crisper and clean. But at Loft, we tend to go into the Neve because it just sounds nice. It works good for all of them. I've been told by the bosses and several engineers who have used the studio, it is a safe preamp to use because, well, it's pleasant sounding. And it works with almost, well, works with most instruments, especially vocals. So that's why I use it. I have tried the other preamps, but like I said, I don't know enough to properly tell you the difference or which one I prefer if I'm honest. Maybe I should do a bit more experimentation. There hasn't been too much recording in the past few months, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but it's the most used preamp I'd say. And finally, the plugins we use in the studio tend to be, again, the same ones. Don't get me wrong, we have a lot of choices uh, for a good few plugins. Like, we've got access to sound toy collections, and if they had fab filters, I'd definitely use them. But when I record someone, I tend to use the same plugins, like the CLA compressors. Normally, the CLA 2A. Admittedly, because compression confuses me. Like, I've tried to work it out for years, and I still don't fully understand how it works or if it sounds right when I'm using it. And if any engineer says they know how to perfectly use compression, then I think they're probably lying, just because it just doesn't make any sense. I don't think many people understand it fully. Which is why I like to use the CLA 2A, because it only has two dials on it, and because I've used it a lot, I can hear subtle differences when I do use it. But that is my go-to compressor when I'm recording vocals. I also use the CLA 76 sometimes as well, and switch between the black and the blue settings depending on if I need it, the vocals to sound more aggressive or anything like that. But I tend to stick with the CLA compressors. For EQs though, I use the Cubase standard one. I know each different EQ has characteristics which makes them sound different. Like one of them's based on like one's based on analog machines like the Pultec. They're probably gonna sound a bit warmer and have a bit more fuzz and distortion on the low end, because that's what old analog equipment do. 
But to be honest, I'm not worried about adding warmth or character with my EQ. When I'm EQing, I want to tackle two things. One, low end muddiness, which I use a high pass filter to sort out, and any harshness from the vocals, like sibilant. I tend to either do a cut anywhere between 2k and 8k, or actually use a DS because that's what they're designed for. And considering most EQs work in the same way, at least the parametric ones do. Semi-parametrics have their own little quirks, but I'm not usually using them. So EQ wise, when I'm in the studio, I usually use the seven band EQ from Cubase itself. And that's it. That's a normal, or probably the most common setup we have for vocals, recording wise at least. Once it's been recorded, then we start doing other stuff, but that becomes quite project specific. And the question was what a normal recording setup looks like. So I'd say I've done that, and hopefully now you know too. So, that's it from me today. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you have any questions about what I've mentioned, or want me to answer something in a future episode, then message me at Wells Media on Facebook and Instagram. This has been Behind the Desk. I've been John, and I shall return in the next episode.